Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much. So, in order to understand um, college, you need to meet my son's camp. <laughs> my son's camp is the smartest breathing creature in my house. <laughs> because while the rest of us are getting up in the middle of the night and going off and doing wonderful things to change the world, there is that crucial moment where, in reality, we all just want to go back to bed. And my cat, my son's cat, does exactly that. <laughs> and, and for reasons that I can't quite figure out, she does not do that in my son's bed, she does that in my bed. <laughs> so, when it comes time for us to leave, and, and go do those wonderful things in the world, um, we, we can't exactly make the bed, because you don't move the cat. So what we have to do is we have to sort of work around the cat and, and sort of make the bed, but not really in accordance with the rules of bed making. And, and that works, because then we go off to work. Except, of course, when we come back, the first thing I say when I get back in the bedroom is, what is that doing there? Because that's the way my bed looks, but the cat's not there anymore. In my head, I'm thinking, no, no, it's supposed to look like this. <laughs> Why does it look like that? And, and so it, it has taken, thanks to my cat, to my son's cat, it's taken a while for me to sort of get used to this, but I have to tell you, now that I've sort of jumped to the other side of bed making, I really like the new position because every great once in a while when I come home, my wife will beat me home and she'll look at the bed and say, did you forget to do something today? And I'll say, gosh, honey, I would have loved to have made the bed, but the cat, what can I My My son's cat required me to sort of really reconsider the feel of, uh, of, of bed making. And, and that's exactly what needs to happen as we think about college. Um, because realistically, what, what we've been taught to do after so many years is to consider college access, college opportunity, and college itself to be sort of this, this mysterious algorithm, this mysterious mix of data that we don't all quite understand. Right? And, and a lot of this has been perpetuated by, by uh, rankings, by college rankings. And, and, and the thing about college rankings, after you look at them for a while, they're based on some pretty obscure facts. Um, the, the, the big, one of the biggest ones is the college's selectivity. Now, every, every spring when the colleges announce their admissions decision, what they say is this was a record number of, of applicants this year, which is true. But, but the, the colleges aren't admitting any more students. They have more applicants, but they don't admit more students. So that means their percentage, their, their selectivity percentage, is always going down. And the, the smaller your percentage, the, the higher your rank. Well, that, there, there's something wrong with that for really three reasons. First, what that means in theory is that the only way you know you can be the highest ranked college in the United States is to literally not admit a single student. <laughs> and, and I gotta tell you, there are colleges that have thought, maybe this could be the year. Maybe because you know there are students, I gotta tell you, there are students where I, that I work with who say, you're gonna apply there, man, nobody gets it. It could be true, right? <laughs> the, the other challenge though, of course, is is that Students are, are equating popularity with quality. They're deciding what's going to be a good school for them based on what's a good school for other people. And, and just to give you a, a little bit of a, a hint about that, um, the, there's a director of admissions at, at, a, at a large, very well-respected public institution 
And, and he has told me that, that every year he hopes they win the big football game, which is usually the third week in October, because if they win, if they win the football game, applications will go up 5%. They're, they're going to get 5% more applications because they won the football. The, the third reason why I, I think things are sort of twisted around a little bit is because in, in reality, getting into college has nothing to do with the rankings. The, the basis, what college, colleges look for, has nothing to do with all those factors that go into the rankings. And of course, the college experience itself doesn't have much to do with it. When college admissions officers come and talk to my students at my school, and students say, what does it take to get into our college, to your college? They're expecting data. They're expecting numbers. And they're really thrown for a loop when instead, the college admissions officers, to a person, answer that question by saying, what do your kids think about? We want to know what our applicants think about. What matters to them? How do we know that matters to them? What have they done with the opportunities they've had in high school? What have they, had, what have they done with the opportunities they've had outside of high school? What they're really looking for, then, are qualities of character. That's what people are looking for when they review college applications. And in fact, that's really the basis of a successful college experience. So it takes my students some time to sort of realize that what they thought they knew about college really has to sort of take a back burner. And instead, what they must focus on are the qualities that the colleges are looking for, because those qualities make for a great college experience as well. Now, this is such a mind-blowing thing for some students that they are then convinced, if they find out early enough, that they should probably quit high school and go climb Mount Everest <laughs> or cure cancer. And I say to them, you know, if you can cure cancer when you're 16, I will permit you to drop out of high school. <laughs> but the reality is that when colleges talk about these issues, they're not really looking for anything too terribly big. They're actually looking for something rather small. Small things that make a difference in the lives of our students. My wife teaches elementary school science. And a few weeks ago, the lesson was, with her younger students, was floats or sinks. Which, actually, if you think about it, is, has a lot to do with college admissions. But that's a story. <laughs> so, so we, we take a glass full of water and we put an orange piece of paper on it and, and boys and girls, does it float or does it sink? It floats. Great. So we fish the piece of paper out and then we put in a carrot. Now immediately we can rule out that all orange things float. <laughs> so we're making it real happy. Does the carrot float or sink? It sinks. Now, because my wife is infinitely smarter than I am, she also has found some things that when you first put them in water, stay to the surface, and then they drop down, and then they come back up, and then they drop down, they, and it's kind of hard to sort out exactly what they do. So then she says to the class, boys and girls, what does this do? And the room is silent, except for one voice. And that voice says, well, sometimes it floats, and sometimes it sinks, so it flinks. <laughs> that child is going to college. <laughs> That's what the colleges are looking for. That's what they're looking for. Right? Students who look at things and ask the questions other students don't, that are driven to make a difference in their life. Those little things that we don't think actually matter, but really do. The, the basketball team in Connecticut, who a few weeks ago, they've been playing together forever. They were in fifth grade. And, and suddenly, uh, they were about to play a game towards the end of their season, and the director of the league came to the right before tip-off and said to the coach, 
Well, we kind of made a mistake because once you get to fifth grade, you can't have a co-ed team anymore. So, so th three of your players can't play anymore because it's an all boys league. This is the day of the game. And, and so the coach went to the team and explained the situation. And, and the entire team, every member of the team said, we play together, but we, but we don't play. Those kids are going to college. Those kids are going to college. But the student of mine at uh, Cranbrook, who was captain of the swim team, and as, a, as an 11th grade, came to the director of our summer camp. We have a summer camp at the school. That we, where we primarily serve students from urban areas. And so they come to the campus and <coughs> participate in a lot of activities. Um, and so during the school year, this, this junior a student of mine goes to the uh, director of the program and says, you know, I just read this, this article that says that urban, students who live in urban areas have like five times the greater chance of drowning because they don't know how to swim. So do you think the swim team could teach your students how to swim? Now, that student is no longer at Cranbrook. He's gone to college, so he is going to college. <laughs> but the program is in its fifth year without him. Think of what that student has done for so many students that he hasn't even met because he looked at the world for them. That's the college experience. That's the college experience. So, as my students sort of embrace this, this newfound piece of how important it is, I try and give them some new context. Because the whole number-driven component about college is really stressing them out, and it's leading our country into very dangerous directions, because we're forgetting what the real purpose of college is. And so, when my students come into my office and start talking about their college plans, this is the question I ask. This is the question I ask. What's next for you? And I gotta tell you, the answers that you get to that question are just amazing. My friends and I were playing around with this computer language this summer called Fortran. We read about it in some computer history book. <laughs> Have you heard of that, Dr. O'Connor? And I say, yeah, be quiet, just keep going. <laughs> well, anyway, we think there's some interesting applications to the next iteration of the i7 iPhone. And we'd like to sort of see how that plays out in college. Fine. Right? Um, my, my, my brother's uh, disease is he's making good progress and they're making steps towards having a cure. Uh, but I think I want to go to med school and help that out. Um, my, my summers, I spent my summers in South Korea uh, working in an in a old people's home with women who were sex slaves during World War II. And there's an agency there that's trying to get justice for them and their families. That's probably going to take about another 20 years, and I'm going to go to law school to do that. So, I have to tell you, those are way better answers to a way better question. I could have started by saying, where do you want to go to college? But then all I get is a list. Instead, I ask what's next, and I get a part of their life. And when you're a school counselor and you can get a part of your life, that's a way better deal. I got it. Now, ultimately, we'll get down to the question of where is the next best place for you to do these things. But if you start out asking, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about redesigning your backyard, and the first question you ask, is what tree do you want to plant, you get an answer. But if the first question you ask is, what do you want it to look like at the end, that's a way better answer. Right? Now, what I just said was that asking what's next helps me. 
But it isn't about me. It's about the students. And of course, it helps the students tremendously. There are two very large groups of students in our society right now that we need to support a great deal. The first one are what I call the punch the clock students. These are the students who will dutifully get up every morning and go to class and sit there and go to the next class and sit there and go to the next class and sit there. And, and when you talk to them about the prospect of going to college, they just sigh like middle-aged men. <laughs> because they're exhausted. They are exhausted and they just want to get off the assembly line. If you give them the question of what's next, what you're doing is you're giving them permission to step back and look at the big picture. You're giving them a chance to connect the dots. You're inviting them to find the relevance of today as it relates to the relevance of tomorrow. Then all of a sudden they realize that what they don't need is a break. What they need is new perspective. And once they do that, they realize that it isn't just simply a question of, of, of four more years of learning. But instead, it's an adventure with a lot of twists and turns in that room. The second group is a little different, but their challenge is about the same. This is the group that understands the importance of college, whether it's six months, a year, two years, ten years, whatever it may be. But these students are highly organized. They, they think they understand the college application process, they understand what they need to be college ready to make the most of the college experience, and they, and they quantify that in a series of activities. I take these classes for the next four years, I participate in these activities, I'll do this community service. They put together a very nice grid for their lives. That's very noble and it's very remarkable. But the challenge for those students is that sometimes it doesn't become a question of living their lives, it becomes a question of checking off the boxes. And so what we need to do for the students who have really decided to make their life a grid is to invite them to look past them to look beyond just the satisfaction of checking the box and remember the vitality of the experiences themselves. Because as you can see from this next picture, you can either focus on the grid or you can focus on what's past the grid. And doing both is fairly important. There are 1307 days in the high school experience between the first day that the student starts ninth grade and the day in senior year when they hear back from their college. For any student, wherever you might be on that particular uh, experience, whether you're at day 89, at day 245, or even if you're at day 10,030 or 1030, the real question is not what will that last day look like? The real question isn't what will day 10 or day 7 look like? The real question is, what's next for 